Hello, everyone. I'm Glenn Holst. Um, my colleague, Dina Gratley, is here. We are recording this session. Uh, we are from the Core Visualization Lab. And we are not a research lab. We are a research support lab. So we, we support researchers by providing uh, technical guidance and training um, to help domain experts process their data, understand it, gain insights into it. Um, so we're here today with a tutorial on how to process image text to segment out the objects um, so that we can explore them in 3D meshes or analytically. I'm going to send a link to everyone. Some new people have come. And so th this is a link to the uh, training page. It's now in the chat. There you will find access to uh, slides and data sets that you can use when you try to kind of work through the materials yourself later. Um, you should try to download those materials now. If you encounter any issues, uh, please let us know in the chat and we will try to assist. There are multiple different data sources for this, including uh, VizLab download links, but also Data Waha. So if you have trouble with one, uh, please try the other. With that, uh, we shall begin. Hopefully you can see the, the, the slide deck on your um, shared screen. So as I mentioned, our core lab is there to help a scientist uh, transform raw data, such as from the microscopes, into understanding. And we do this through a variety of techniques, including uh, scientific visualization and VR, through InfoViz and data analytics, and through 3D reconstruction. And this is what we're going to explore uh, now. So just some examples of the data visualizations that we have done, both for scientific and InfoViz. The other thing that we do have is facilities that can help display the results of these visualization workflows, particularly the ones that we're about to see today. So whether your data comes from uh, microscopy data or for simulation, or whether you need just to explore it personally or you need room-sized VR facilities to work through it with colleagues or to share with colleagues, uh, we have those facilities as well. And if you have visualization needs, please uh, reach out to us. There'll be links at the end. And through the webpage that you have, there's also the help at viz.coast.edu.sa emails as well. So what we're going to talk about today is a little background on image processing, which is what I'm going to provide next. That'll, that basically will be providing the kind of conceptual framework to help understand the rest of the tutorial and the walkthroughs of the tools. Adina will then provide a, a tutorial walkthrough to show pre and post processing uh, with the visa and pixel classification uh, with the, the two main tools that we uh, support. And then at the end, I'll provide a batch processing pixel classification demo on IVEX, which is our HPC cluster, show you how part of a complete workflow that lets you interactively work on uh, a workstation to train the pixel classification, but then run the compute heavy processes on a large computer. What we'll, I'm gonna cover next is a little bit of image processing theory, uh, about what the image processing pipeline is like. We'll talk a little bit about the image stack that comes out of, that starts this off um, or is in the middle of it, if that, depending on your, your view. We'll look at some of the requirements that reconstruction has on the, the, the image stack and what are some of the qualities and types and characteristics of these image stacks um, that determine uh, what type of uh, segmentation and uh, reconstruction we can do with it. And then we'll look at a variety of different segmentation techniques. So the image processing pipeline starts right at the very beginning with the microscopes. You know, it starts with uh, the images that come off the microscopes. Uh, they may be split into small sections. They may be distorted because of how they, the sample is cut. Um, and those distortions and those multiple images from the same plane need to be stitched together. And from that, we turn it into a stack of images that represent, you know, the full depth of the sample. Um, and from there, some other processing is done to make it a well-behaved image stack. Uh, things like Z alignment, so that all the features align in Z space or normalization. Now, uh, ICL, the Imaging and Characterization 
core lab, which runs the, uh, which provides the microscopes and the, the microscope services. Uh, they're the ones who will, who were responsible for the first parts of this process. So by the time they're done, you will either have kind of a raw image stack that you need to clean up, or you will have a cleaned up, ready to process image stack. And that's basically where we come in. The tool that we are will be showing you today, Aviso, does have the capability of doing image stack alignment and normalization. So even if your image stack is kind of in the, the early stages, it hasn't been fully processed yet, we can still help you with that. But having a, a completely ready, uh, aligned, normalized image stack is typically the nice starting place for the rest of the segmentation process. And that's where we come in with the segmentation part to help separate the image out into objects and then the 3D reconstruction, which turns it into viewable objects, meshes and things that you can see in 3D. Yeah, so this is the part that we're going to work on. So once you have your image stack, there's two paths that you can go to work with them. We're going to be working with the segmentation path today. So what segmentation does is it takes the image stack and it separates it out into labels and the labels represent objects that are in the image stack. Once we have these objects, there's a lot of ways that we can take this afterwards. We can use those objects to turn into 3D meshes and revisualize them again, you know, maybe turning some on or off or enabling us to, to delve deeper into those objects, or we can do analysis based off where the objects are located or where they touch. We can do porosity analysis, for example, or skeletonization. A lot of different opportunities for analysis and visualization present themselves after we have segmented the image stack. But that isn't the only route, and it depends what you want to do with the image um, that determines if this is the right path for you. Because the other thing that you can do, depending on the image stack, is just render it directly. And in the previous scientific visualization workshops that we have had, especially the one that Thomas Fusel gave on, on a, using a viso, you saw some of these approaches when we did volume rendering. We had, a, we had a, an image set where um, in this 3D array, the uh, each of the points, though the voxels in space, uh, was re represented a density of something, and we could control how that density was rendered, um, and then get access to interesting parts of that, that image, the 3D image space. So, you know, we can we can slice it and kind of see, get cross sections and see it on the inside, do ISO surfaces and a bunch of other interesting things. But the volume rendering route is more for qualitative analysis, where you kind of want to see what's there, get a sense of things. But if you want quantitative analysis, that's where the segmentation route comes in. And that's what we're going to explore now. What do we need to be able to segment an image stack? Well, we need an image stack and it has to be a high quality one. So what does that mean? That there's a one-to-one -one mapping between image and object space, that nearby object features are nearby in the image. And we will see some examples of this, but a photograph is, you know, where you can see someone in the foreground and mountains in the background is an example where this is not the case, right? You have on the same image plane, you have projected things that are near and far. We also need sufficient resolution so that we can see the features that we're interested in. And objects need to have distinct features or boundaries to be able to distinguish one from the other. And we need those features to be consistent throughout the entire image stack. Uh, what do we mean by a one-to-one -one mapping between image and object space? So that would be an example where on the right hand side is your object space and hopefully you know your 3d vision systems are very good and you can see that we have a, a ball and a cube and a, a, another uh, triangular type shape in 3d and on the left hand side is our image stack and each each one of the images in the stack is a slice through this object space and to see that again we see that each one represents correctly the depth through the, the object space. 
So an example where this wouldn't be very good is if we got bleed or blur through from different levels where you could see you know, a little bit of the front sphere and also a little bit of the, you know, maybe the bit of the back of the front sphere, but a bit of the front of the cube at the same time. That would not be good. The other thing is, to, you know, like, like a photograph where you can see near and far things, you know, even if you, you get a slice of the object space, but there are things appearing in that slice that are not from that particular depth. That doesn't work. And an example of this might be an electron microscopy microscopy, where you have, you know, you've seen them use some beautiful images of, of insects, for example, and you can see, you know, the antennas and the mouth and the body all in the same image. It's like a photograph. And basically you have a 3D object projected onto a 2D plane. That doesn't work. So, you know, what will happen uh, to make samples work this way, you might be embedding them in something else, like some sort of resin or some, prepare them in a way that when you take that slice, there's something preventing you from seeing further into the distance. So for, in this example, there's a slice kind of in the middle of this object space that has cut the sphere in half, but we can still see the back of it. So maybe if, if the object had been well prepared to go into the microscope, there would be some kind of opaque resin or something there that, that would uh, prevent you from seeing all the way into the object. And then you get just the features at a particular level. So that's basically what you would like is just a slice from that one level. The other quality of importance is to have sufficient resolution. So on the right is the object space where we have a bunch of pebbles or uh, soil particles connected to each other and we're interested in maybe the voids. But if we don't have enough uh, resolution, we cannot make out the individual objects. The resolution that we have is part a function of the microscope and a function of the objects that we're interested in, how big or small they are. Without sufficient resolution, we're not going to be able to segment out objects. Now, we, there's still some potentially interesting things that we could do. We could do some maybe statistical analysis of you know estimates based uh, estimates of the amount of void space, assuming that all the particles have the same density, right? And assuming that uh, what we get at each pixel is an average of the densities in that, in that area, in that volume. That's an example where we couldn't do object extraction. We also have to make sure that the image slices are sufficiently thin. This is, again, a resolution issue, but we make a distinction because human vision is very good at seeing, you know, when there's gaps or insufficient resolution at in the XY plane of an image when everything can be seen at once. But as you kind of uh, scroll, slide through the image stack, you know, one image at a time, you may not notice how much of an offset or a jump there is between the boundaries of these objects. So for you, you can kind of follow the progression of the object through the stack, but the segmentation algorithms don't see it that way. So you imagine the object on the right has been cut into very thick slices, and we only kind of see the top of, of each slice. We will know the, the thickness of each slice. And so based on that, we, you know, we may not understand that it's actually going at an angle. It kind of, we assume that all the entire depth of the slice looks the same. And so from the software's point of view, it looks like a bunch of rings that are kind of offset from each other. And the problem is, is that there are gaps there in the Z direction that if we're trying to, uh, let's say do like a watershed segmentation, that there's kind of a gap where the watershed algorithm can kind of escape the object and enter in nearby objects. So to get a sense of, of what's happening, let's look at this case here, where we kind of go through the image stack that happens to be very thick. And uh, let's go back again, when we run it, you know, you can, you can kind of see that, yes, it, you know, you can follow the object along. But if you were able to see things all at once, which is closer to the view that the 3D, that the segmentation algorithms have, you would, it would actually look like this. And so there looks like there's holes in it. You want sufficient resolution and sufficiently thin slices that you don't have holes in this direction either. I will mention that 
you, you know, holes in, in the Z direction isn't the only way that you can get holes, but typically the other ones, you will probably notice yourself directly. And an example can be with staining. Sometimes the staining of cell boundaries doesn't, um, that the stain doesn't get quite everywhere. And so there can be some boundaries, you know, cells where the external part of the cell uh, is missing some of the stain. And so it looks like you can't see the, 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 the cell boundary. And so it just looks like one cell is merged into another. And even though most of the stack has the cell connected, there's one spot where there's a hole, that's where it can leak out. Now, there are algorithms that help deal with this, that kind of, uh, and, and Elastic, one of the tools that we will mention has support for these, but those are advanced features. Ideally, we have a, a good image stack to begin with. The other quality that we want is that objects have distinct features or boundaries. You can think of this as the locality of information. So your 3D and your image system is very good at seeing the entire picture, the global space of, of the image. And we can see that there's triangles, square, circle laid out here, even though in, in one case, there are gaps in the boundary. We kind of understand that this kind of zipper or fence around these objects. We understand that they're meant to kind of connect together, even though they don't actually connect in the image space. <clears throat> we can also tell on the right-hand side of the image that, you know, the pattern orientations are different. The best way to think about, you know, it, it is does the image stack support segmentation is to think maybe from like an ant's point of view. If you were crawling around the image and only had local information, things like patterns and textures, and maybe, maybe orientations, would that be enough information so that you could tell when you cross the boundary between one object and another? And if it isn't, then the segmentation uh, tools are going to have problems. If you can tell even at a local level, they will they will be able to usually be able to work. And usually the, the smaller the locality, when you can make a good judgment whether you're in one object or another, or crossing the boundary from an object to another, the easier the segmentation becomes. So another issue can arise from what we consider to be an object and not an object. We might consider, let's say, you know, the bone inside of a CT scan is an object, that's bone. But if we look close enough, bones, parts and part of them is porous and the densities there are going to vary. If you have a very high resolution image, you can see that the bone itself has high, nearly equal density and that there are voids in it. And the voids have also kind of an equal density to each other and to the air around it. But if our resolution gets too low, we may begin to average out these features. And so where the bone is thick, we will have you know, one density. And when it's porous, we will have another. And we may have certain kind of patterns show up. And in the image on the right, it's hard to locally separate the kind of porous parts of inside the bone uh, versus the flesh or other things that are, are outside the bone because the patterns and textures are, are fairly similar. And again, just to ask if you were looking at a small little region of that, would you be able to tell the difference? So in this case, we could probably segment out what is the external, the, the boundary layer of the bone, which tends to be the most dense fairly well. But we probably couldn't tell the difference between you know, muscles and, and organs and the insides of the bone. We may be able to use things like um, watershed segmentation techniques, though, because the outer part of the bone is well discriminated. We could, you know, combine a variety of techniques to, to then, you know, after you've done your classification in, into dense bone and not dense bone, and then we could do with a little bit more training into body versus inner bone and then get out the entire object as we conceive it as a bone. Another important quality of the image stack is that we have consistent representations of features throughout. Now here's kind of a you know ridiculous example where although we obviously have the same objects, their representation changes quite radically. Obviously that kind of jumps out, but typically we have something more like this where the intensity is 
is varying over the image. And, and sometimes that intensity varies over, you know, quadrants of the image. You know, one corner tends to be brighter than another. Uh, we'll see some examples of this later on as well. But I'll bring this to your attention here because, because these are different layers, we may not notice. Uh, our visual system is very good for correcting for these sorts of differences. But the algorithms are really looking kind of absolute intensities uh, as opposed to like relative ones. They will have difficulties <clears throat> de determining that we are still dealing with the same object. So what might happen is that as this whole image gets darker, we might begin thinking that we're looking at background or, or triangle objects, you know, because the triangle, oops, the, the, because the triangle started out darker, right? So this is where normalization comes in and becomes important, especially local, uh, localized normalization. And um, I believe tools like Aviso and Fiji, Fiji uh, or ImageJ provide these tools, and this may get covered in the um, in the next section. Let's talk a little bit about the sources for the image stacks, the different type of microscopes, and what type of image stacks they tend to produce as far as their usability for segmentation. SEM is scanning electron microscope. So the way that it works is it scans, it shoots an electron into your sample. The depth that the electron travels into the sample is a, is a function of how much, how much energy that electron has. And then the electron bounces back a little bit like, you know, light, but it's an electron. And it will reveal some information about the parts of the sample that it, it traversed on its path. So the scan depends upon energy levels. So there are some good things about it in that we, we first we scan and then we slice. So the alignment on, um, on these image stacks tends to be better to begin with. But if the slice depth is thicker or greater than the scanning depth, this is where we can get these Z gaps appearing. So the pixel values represent electron reflectivity, uh, which can usually be good, provided that the sample has been well prepared. So typically for you know, cell samples that have been stained to make different parts of the cells highlight in a different way, to have different electron re reflectivity so we can see them better. So if the source object is dense, or has the voids have been filled in, then we will also get good matching between the object space and the image space as well. So that's good. So a possible complication is that the object may have void spaces and you may be seeing you know, deeper into the sample at a particular slice. And that's, and that's gonna throw off the segmentation algorithms. Okay, another type of electron microscope is the transmission electron microscope. Uh, what it does is it slices the sample first and then passes the electron all the way through. One of the issues with them is that because the slicing is done first, if this can tend to, to warp the sample a little bit, and so sometimes the, the alignment can be challenging because the, the entire surface of that object can be kind of warped. But because the electron goes all the way through, there's no Z gaps, so that's good. Um, the pixel values represent electron opacity. And so again, depending on how the, the sample was prepared, that can be good. So the nice thing about this is that even in an object that has voids in it, mm -hmm. we are not seeing deeper into the object because it's been cut first. The electron is not going to hit something deeper in that object and then bounce back. So that's actually a good thing about TM images. Another type is tomography. So electron tomography is, is basically where you're going to shoot electrons in at multiple different angles. And from the multiple different orientations, you're going to reconstruct a 3D scene. So or algorithmically re reconstruct. So uh, pixel values represent density, uh, which typically that's a good thing. And they're high resolution, which is good. And the image pixel coordinates match you know, the 3D scene coordinates, which is also a good thing. Another example of this can be CT scans, which are also a type of tomography. So they're, again, similar sort of qualities. One issue, though, might be, you know, lower resolution. And that, and so it depends what you're trying to, to look at. Um, if you're looking for very, very fine detail, it just might not be there. Finally, for our microscopes sources is the confocal. 
microscopes. It focuses light from different directions onto a layer of the sample. And the sample has been treated to fluoresce when it gets enough light energy in. And this is how you end up kind of illuminating just a particular layer. But as the light comes together, it gets brighter and brighter. And so you tend to get a fairly thick slice where you're getting information out of the sample. And this means that you are not creating, you don't really have one good one-to-one -one mapping between the object and the image space. You kind of get bleed through from nearby uh, in the sample. These ones tend to correspond poorly with the object space. They tend to be blurred as well, you know, ends up being a resolution is issue. So they can make for a very nice visual, 3D visual inspection. You, you can see them in 3D using the, the volume rendering techniques. You can do a little bit of segmentation on them. It won't be that accurate, but it might be enough just to give you a sense of where some of the things are, um, but it's not really, it's not good for, for analysis. I would, wouldn't recommend it for that. Um, what are some other characteristics of the image stack that are good or necessary or useful to know about? One of them is the resolution that we are at and how that affects our ability to process and segment. Typically, the image processing that we're talking about here, we work on the image at the pixel level. So a lot of times the scientists will come in and, and so for them, <clears throat> the physical size of things, how many nanometers and things of that is important. Um, but for us, that isn't as important when we segment things out. It's really kind of at the pixel level. Now, when we get to the analysis afterwards, that's when these scale information can be important so that we know the correspondence between a pixel and a, a real units. So more pixels, higher resolution. With that, you get more details, which is good, but it does require more memory. So you need larger memory machines or to run it on a cluster. And it can also slow processing time. Uh, which can be undesirable, but fewer pixels, you will get less detail. And this is okay up to a point, but then it becomes very, very bad. You lose the important pieces of information. So it's always better to start with a high resolution and then downsample. You can always throw some information away you didn't weren't interested in so that you can do the actual processing instead of not getting that information to begin with, because you cannot reproduce the missing information once it's gone. You know, with few, fewer pixels, we do use uh, less memory and can do faster processing, which is a good thing. But for the most part, with the cluster workflows that we're going to show, performance isn't an issue, usually. Okay, another aspect of the image resolution is how many pixels represent a feature. You know, as you're looking through your image stack and you're trying to figure out, is there enough resolution here for me to be able to do segmentation? And you're looking at kind of the boundary layers between objects, for example, or, you know, the features of interest. If it's like 10 pixels or more, that's probably good enough to be able to recognize very accurately. If you're down to like, you know, three pixels and less, it's not hard for there to be a little bit of noise, a gap that can basically let the uh, watershed algorithms uh, bleed through. A little noise or a missing staining somewhere can introduce a hole when you have you know, just a few pixels representing that feature. Image stacks are made from, from images, and so they have a number of characteristics that images also have things like channels, which is the number of values per pixel. So they may have, you know, red, green, blue, so it may be like a, a color image. And each of those channels may have kind of overlapping, but, but not identical information that can help you pick, uh, pick out features of interest. There are also images that are pure grayscale. They only measure in the intensity at that, at that point. So they're single value. We can also have different kind of dimensions of image stacks. We can have you know, so 3D image stacks, the third dimension can either be in the Z direction, which is, you know, like a volume, or they could be a time series, like a movie. So maybe you're taking an image of a plate of cells growing. And so you might end up with kind of like an image stack as well, but, but when we process it, we're interpreting that extra dimension as time and not depth. And so, you know, we would use algorithms that fairly similar, but help us, you know, track objects and, and uh, notice when, when they merge or, or split or things like that. So each channel is going to be represented 
at, at the low level using an integer of some sort, a bunch of bits. We may get, for example, a 8-bit image. So we, we may get 8-bit unsigned, which is probably the most common type of, of image. And so in this case, we can represent values from 0 to 255. 0 is black and 255 is white. These images are also used for label images. So because the, the pixel values are represented as numbers, in this case, 0 to 255, we could represent, after we segment, we could represent 255 objects. Another type of image you may come across is an 8-bit signed. So in this case, the values go from negative 128 to 127, again, from black to white. But there's an issue here. If we misinterpret that, if we process a signed image as unsigned, um, it will map all the low values, which are the blacks to the grays, into high values, gray to white. And what was white will appear to be a gray, mid-level gray. So it'll kind of swap these intensity values around. That may be an issue. We can also represent pixels uh, or the, you know, the channels with uh, larger numbers, like 16-bit unsigned. These are less common. The DCM images that I think um, Dina provided might have those. They can represent, uh, for each pixel, um, 65,000 values. That's a lot of grays probably more than we can perceive. So we might have trouble seeing, you know, neighboring values, or, uh, but the segmentation algorithms can notice that difference. And it's not uncommon, let's say, from CT scans that the range of values that they can distinguish can be in the order of a few thousand, right? Not six, it might not be 65,000, but, you know, once you go to a thousand, 2,000 values that you can distinguish, of density that you can distinguish between, uh, you can't represent this in 8-bit anymore without losing information. So they will put it in a 16-bit file. Some of the values, the, the minimum value might not be zero. It might be some arbitrary value, you know, 16,000. And the maximum value doesn't have to be 65,000. It might be 18,500 or whatever. So there might be some range of this image where you have the interesting values and you can use histograms to kind of get a, a sense of what that is. One of the issues is that, of course, these images tend to be much larger. In fact, because they're image stacked, it tends to be eight times larger than the corresponding 8-bit unsigned. So you might be able to uh, downsample uh, these images into 8-bit, by selecting just the range of interest. If you try to compress the entire image, you would be wasting a lot of the 8-bit space representing things, values that you were never using, right? If you, for example, um, let's say there's only like 1,024 values being represented in this large data set, you could compress just that range and then each value in the 8-bit data set would represent four possible values in this high resolution data set. Um, another place where these images show up is when we have lots and lots and lots of objects, more than 255, in an image stack, and we have to give each one of them a number. Each number is an intensity value. Okay, let's talk about label images. A label image is also an image, and it is using the same data format that we use to represent normal images that we're familiar with, but it uses the color values, those channel intensity values, in special ways. The numbers correspond to the ID of an object. So they should be unsigned because that makes it easier to count the objects from zero and so on. The labeling usually starts at one, so zero would be kind of the unlabeled part of the image. Typically, we will be 8-bit because 255 is a lot of objects, but it can be bigger is the segmentation algorithm that actually goes from the image stack to the label image stack. That label image is the segmentation. Now, one of the things just to you know, keep in mind, because if you only have, let's say, three objects in your image stack, they will get numbered you know, one, two, and three. And if you try to look at a label image as if it were an image, it basically looks like there's nothing there because one, two, and three represent very close, very, very close to black, pretty much black, nearly indistinguishable from black, right? A bunch of 
very dark, dark values. And so when you go to look at it, you will not be able to see that there's anything there. <clears throat> but you can adjust the color balance, you can do some things, or you can use a tool like a Viso that knows about labeled images and knows how to display them correctly. And then you'll be able to see the image, the, the objects that have been segmented out. Image formats. So there's um, maybe three that we're going to be familiar with offhand, TIFF, PNG, and JPEG. So PNG and JPEG are well known from the web. <clears throat> TIFF became more famous, popular for um, desktop publishing when, it when they first came out. JPEG is an awful image formatting, it, oh, sorry, it is an awful image format to do segmentation in because it's lossy. It also creates artifacts. So it's not, uh, if you can help it, you know, you will not save your image text in JPEG, but you definitely cannot use JPEG for labeled images because it's really important that you do not lose any information because every bit of information refers to the ID of an object. And if you compress it in a lossy way, the way that JPEG does, you will lose that. It will end up being corrupted. So TIFF and PNG, they do have compression. The compression can be fairly good, but it's non-lossy. You don't lose any information. So when you decompress the image, it's exactly as it was originally, and you preserve these object labels. We already discussed about the appearance of labeled images, that they can appear mostly black, and that you basically need either the right software to view them or a regular image processing like um, a GIMP, ImageJ, Fiji, tools that let you basically scale what the color balance is will also let you see. If you can, if you can readjust that, you can also see what the segmentation labels are. Uh, but normally in a regular image viewer, they'll just appear black. So uh, what we've seen so far is the characters and the, the qualities that an image stack should have the qualities that the different kind of microscope technologies, the image stacks that they produce, what qualities do they have, characteristics. We have seen a little bit about the technical attributes of the image stack, you know, its bit depth, number of channels, and things like that. Uh, now we want to talk about processing that image stack for best results. So one of the things that we need to do is to align the features. So we, we already mentioned that you know, you want a good correspondence between the image space and the object space. And that, you know, what can happen as part of the microscopy or the way that these stacks are, are created, that they may not perfectly align. Aligning them is one of the pre-processing steps that's needed before we can do segmentation. And below is an example. On the left-hand side is unaligned. On the right-hand side is aligned. Now, it may not, it may seem almost backwards to you because the image on the left the alignment is to the outside edges of the image. But if you look at one particular spot, it looks like maybe a mouse or a rat brain, and you watch kind of where it goes, it jumps around in the image. But if you look on the image on the right, although the outer edge of the image gets moved around, if you stay focused to a, a, a part of the brain and just watch how it changes over time, it does it smoothly. So it doesn't stay in the same spot because as we're going through the slices, we're getting a different larger piece of the brain and then a smaller piece. So the boundaries change, but they do so in a way that they don't jump around back and forth, right? So it's basically ensuring that you get this nearby quality of the stack. So normalization is about getting, ensuring that kind of like the, across the image, both depth-wise and the XY, that, that features have uh, similar features, preserve their similar pixel intensity all the way across. So this is something that can be hard for you to notice. And so you might go ahead and start doing segmentation on, or do some training. And the training might be okay, but you'll end up having to do more because you, what you might notice is that, you know, nearby, the algorithms are actually figuring out what the, what the objects are quite well. But as you go deeper and deeper into the stack, you kind of have to retrain and retrain and retrain instead of it kind of learning once and going all the way through. Uh, and here's a good example of that. Here is, I think this is an image of a seed of some, some, some type. This is basically kind of all the slices in this image stack shown as a montage. 
And what we see is as we go through the slices, I think this, this might have been from a conf confocal microscope, near the top is the brightest. But as we go deeper and deeper into the sample, it starts to get darker and darker and darker. And so things which are the same, like the cell boundaries and so on, just have different intensities. And so they're going to look different. They start looking more and more like the noise, you know, on the outside of the seed. What we want is something like this. So this is an example of a normalized montage where from top to bottom, we are somewhat preserving the intensity values for for similar parts of the image. It's a little bit tricky because normalization doesn't really know about where the objects are. It's basically just trying to keep the statistical variance of intensities similar across all the images, images, which may not always be the case. So for example, you know, you might get a part of the image that is only a small part, part of the object. Let's say that object is bright. So you have mostly dark and a little bit of bright. Then as you get deeper into the object, there's more object and less outside. The algorithms that we tend to use for normalization I tend to be localized. But that's an example of, of what normalization will help do. It kind of brings all the features out to appear uh, equal across all the images and training will become much simpler as a result. Another issue that can um, plague us is noise in the data, in the image data. This can come from a variety of sources. It can be, you know, from the image sensors themselves. It can be from noise in our sample um, or just variations in our sample. Organic objects or whatever can have uh, variation and texture and things like that. Or, you know, we might be operating at, at a resolution where we are getting maybe averages of, of density. And so that's going to vary a little bit. It may be hard to go in and threshold based off just a particular you know, intensity value. You know, theoretically, the images that come off a CT scanner are all about the density and different materials at different density. You should just be able to threshold the densities out and you're done. But the noise makes it trickier to do that. And the example that we've got here is an image that's actually purely black and white. There's only two colors in it. But because of how it's dithered, which we call you know, the noise in this case, it looks like you can, you can see a face in there. But if you were to threshold out based off of you know, just the light colors, then you, would just, you wouldn't get the face the way that you see it. And if you, just, if you try to segment out the darker colors, you would, you would also not get the face. So th there are some things that we can do. Uh, we can trade off resolution to make the pixel values more similar. And so what we can do is something like a Gaussian blur that basically takes a neighborhood and kind of gets their average value. And so with enough resolution, we could turn this into a grayscale where now if we got, for example, you know, the mid gray colors, we might get mostly the face. But there are other techniques that are available that look for certain patterns of things. Um, pixel classification does this very well, which is one of the reasons that it's an approach that we advocate. Even with these sort of sort of variations, if the variations have certain patterns, and, um, the certain frequencies in the pattern, whether they're you know high frequency noise or low frequency changes, um, the angles at which they are, these sorts of things can be used by pixel classification to identify different parts of the image. Okay, so that took care of our introduction to the image stack and a variety of aspects about it, its qualities, its attributes, characteristics, what it is, what's some of the pre-processing we need to do to kind of get it into good shape so that we can begin the next part, which is segmentation. So what is segmentation? Well, basically it's taking in this image stack and creating a output a label stack. In the image stack, each of the pixel coordinates represents something like a, a density or reflectivity. But in the output stack, each of those pixels is actually a label, an ID for a particular object. What's going to be important is that there's going to be a one-to-one -one match between the label stack and the image stack are going to have the same size because that's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So here is an example of an image stack and a label stack. So image stack, and we're slowly kind of dissolving that away. And what you get is 
the object. So in this case, what we have, will have done is segmented out connected features in the, in the image space and labeled them as belonging to the same object because they're, we're all touching. And by the time we're done, we will end up with the, these labels and these labels can be turned into actual objects, 3D meshes or descriptions or other things like that. Um, here's another example where, you know, you have an image stack and you can think of all the slices and then the, the, the things which are the same, you can kind of see they've been colored differently in, in the, the label space. And those labels can be turned into objects using techniques like marching cubes and so on that Aviso supports. What are some of the techniques to do this? The easiest is just to do it manually. It's like you, you see kids with a coloring book, it's like color within the lines. That's what manual tracing can do, but it is, it's slow. <laughs> but so its pros are that it works even on lower quality image stacks, things which have gaps in them. And you can have a technician do this. And as long as there's expert review, you can get good results, but it is very, 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 very slow. So it's not a technique that we typically advocate. But an example of a tool that does this, supports it, is called Tracky M2. Um, it's part of uh, Fiji Image J. <clears throat> Another technique is thresholding. And this one is very simple. And for some data sets, provided they have the right qualities and attributes, it works very well. And what it does is basically lets us select a range of values or a cutoff range of so we can say like anything between a value A and value B is going to be my object. So if you've seen the demos done by Thomas, uh, when we, he did the scientific visualization and he was showing, you know, this, the skull image data set and it had air, which was low density, bones, which were mid density, teeth, higher density, and then the tube was, you know, highest density, um, that those occupied certain pixel ranges. And we can basically threshold them out very simply. You just need two values. So basically, if you can tell what object you're looking at just from the pixel, then thresholding would be a good technique to use. Very fast, very simple. There's not a lot that it asks from you. Um, except maybe to find, you know, the, the right boundary values. I mentioned the pros, but it does have some downsides. And the one is, is that when there's a, a lot of noise, you know, you could imagine that you have, or like, remember that, that one where you hit inside and outside the bone. And so maybe outside was a little bit lighter overall, but there were still very dark pixels and very light pixels in there. And so if you tried to do a threshold, you would get some of inside the bone, but not everything, and some outside the bone. It'd be kind of a patchwork, right? Or, and again, the, the example with the, the black and white dithered image of the statue of David that we saw, um, that would be a case where threshold just wouldn't work. Um, another technique is seated watershed or carving. This you would want to use in the case where you have multiple objects that all look the same, but they are different. And you can tell where the boundary is. So an example might be a image stack of brain cells and neurons and, and so on. A brain sample is made from lots of neurons all packed together. They're individual neurons. And if I asked, if I showed you two you know, small spots somewhere in this image stack and ask, do these belong to the same neuron or not? You probably couldn't tell because they, a cell looks the same inside as any other cell. But if I asked you, if I started kind of going from one spot in one cell and traveling along to another point in another cell, I would end up at the boundary layer between them, the outside of the cell or, or so whatever is between the cells. And as soon as I kind of hit that boundary, I know, okay, I've crossed possibly into a different cell. Therefore, I'm going to say these are different. And that's what this watershed carving basically does. What you would do is you, is you kind of train uh, what the boundary is and what the inside is. And it will basically do kind of like a flood fill where it goes through the 3D space and it just tries to see how far it can go finding something similar to the, get the whatever it was trained on for the inside of the cell, um, but it stops when it hits the boundary. And as a result of that, you can then go and segment each cell separately because they will be disconnected. Typically this works with a bit of training 
where you have to label parts of the object space or part of the image space with what you what you, you claim are the labels. This is kind of like the ground truth, whether it's the object or the boundary class. And then the carving, as I mentioned, proceeds by spreading the training out to neighboring pixels like a flood of water. Uh, so in the same way that you know a flood of water doesn't may not go over a dike, the, the boundary ends up being kind of like a dike where the the flood of water doesn't want to cross into. So uh, this method is great for biological cells with stained membranes. It is semi-automated, so a little bit of training can go a long way, provided that it's a good data set, good image stack. <clears throat> so some cons are is that it can be sensitive to gaps or holes in the boundary layer. So it's like if you have a hole in the dike, the water gets through. Also, additional training can undo previous progress. So if you, if, you know, you might have it mostly working and you can almost like the results, but then you go and touch something up, like maybe say, okay, well, this actually was a boundary. It might decide that I won't flood this far because I'm getting too close to what I think might be a boundary. The, the carving of large image stacks can be slow, but it's unattended. So, you know, you just leave it running and, and, and come back later. So it doesn't take up your time as much, but it does kind of slow down the kind of the training evaluate process. And, and that is very, very memory intensive. Okay, and that brings us to pixel classification, which is the technique that we advocate for because it is simple, effective, and covers a wide range of cases where, uh, that you might be interested in. What it, pixel classification does is it looks in the pixel neighborhood. And the, the neighborhood can be fairly large, tens of pixels or more. And it is looking for not just intensity values, but also things like textures and edges and patterns and frequencies and orientations and other sorts of statistical qualities. It works for images where the objects have unique patterns or features. So like if you were to look at image stack of brain cells or cells, and the insides of the cells all look the same. So it, pixel classification would be good for distinguishing between the inside of the cell and the boundary of the cell. And that might be, be useful because you could then use that, let's say, to help with your watershed carving. There's also things inside the cell that have different, um, you know, nucleus and some other different features that look different under the microscopes, just depending how they're how they're stained. And pixel classification can help find all of those at, at once. What makes it good is that it's a general purpose approach that works well for many problems. It's almost as simple as thresholding, but much more useful. It's also semi-automated, like carving is, so a little bit of training can go a long way, and it works well together with other techniques, and it's also easy to parallelize, which is why we provide a workflow for that on the cluster. But it does require loss of memory, uh, which is okay because we're going to run it on the cluster where there, there is loss of memory. So, the, so that's the, the, the segmentation. I just want to talk a little bit about post-processing uh, operations. One of the issues that we may get after we've got our label image stack is that there can be noise in those stacks. You know, so you may have things which were just touching, like maybe two pebbles or two particles, but they may show up as kind of the same object in, in, in the label data and, and, not, and not separate. But what you can, or they may have a little noise around the edge, you know, just because that the, the, there's this noise in the um, in the images themselves. So what you can, there's a technique called a road dilate. You shrink away kind of the edge, wherever there's an edge, you have a particular label and it's at the boundary layer to some different label. You basically erode it away, kind of shrink it and then grow it back. What this tends to do is remove the little artifacts, the little bumps, and it just smooths things out. And the other thing is depending on how much you erode and how much you dilate again, um, you might, also get rid of just little small particulate noise as well. So if you have you know, a few pixels and noise here and there, if you shrink it, let's say we have five pixels, all the four pixel sized objects disappear completely and then they never come back. And that's kind of one way that you can get rid of uh, a noise. This also, you can use edge detection to find out whether there's abrupt changes in, in images. There's, we can look at the histogram for the images to find out whereabouts 
the, it, the pixel intensity values lay. Sometimes there's uh, peaks in that histogram that indicate where certain types of objects might lie, particularly good for uh, thresholdings. You don't have to do that blind. We can also adjust color levels and balance and normalize. There's also um, an, an advanced operation is we can do arithmetic and set operations on, uh, on images. So we take an image stack and then we create a, a label stack from that that's just the boundary. And so we do a very good job of just getting rid of the boundary. And then what we can do is we can subtract the boundary from the original image stack. And now we have everything but the boundary. So we just have the insides. And then let's say that we <clears throat> we're able to discover all the areas that are uh, one type of object. We can do a good job with that. And then we can subtract that again. And so we can kind of use these sorts of techniques to create a segmentation pipeline, it's a bit more complex, but it lets us work at different parts of it at different times and then unify that work together. So what happens after we have got our labeled image stack, our label image stack? What are some of the things that we will want to, might be able to do with it? Well, we can convert it into a 3D mesh so that we can view it inside rendering software like Blender or even Viso supports that. The Viso, of course, also supports viewing the volumes directly. As a volume viewer, we might want to do analysis for it, such as skeletonization or porosity, or we can export that 3D mesh to view in VR. This is an example of how this could be useful. Imagine that you have a data set that is, you know, very dense. It, it's like it, maybe it's a, a, a core sample, or maybe it's a, a sample of brain cells, which are very tightly packed together. And it can be very hard to understand the relationship between, let's say, the different cells and what's in their neighborhood um, by just looking from the outside, because there's so much there, it kind of, everything uh, occludes everything else, basically. And if we have transparency, you end up with a very muddled, murky image, <clears throat> all the colors kind of, all the objects kind of, and their colors blend together. But with VR, you can kind of go inside that data set and just move around to see what are the neighboring objects. So that's an example of some of the ways that you can use the segmented data once you're done. So a few caveats or notes about the kind of the pre-processing and analysis that you might do is that there can be pitfalls. So segmentation may not be calibrated. So the pixel int intensities uh, may relate to density, but their values might not be the absolute density, right? <clears throat> so if you're trying to compute something based off what you think is the density, there's no guarantee that, that that's the case. Or pixel intensities may drift over multiple samples. So this is what you'll need to be able to take care of if you have a workflow that where you're continuously uh, bringing in data from a microscope. Over time, mm -hmm. the, the, the images themselves begin to drift as far as um, their intensity values. And so you'll want to ensure that these remain calibrated if you're using this for your analysis. The other thing that can be, help is that once you have created your segmentation and you've created a 3D object mesh out of it, you can try to make sure that they align. And in some of the workflows that we've seen at KAUST, where teams of biologists and, and technicians have worked together to segment images out, they will use, for example, the large display wall or the VR facilities to compare their segmentation with the actual image and then use the domain expert to make sure that the biology and, and the segmentation kind of match up. Okay, so we've talked today about image stacks and at a conceptual level. We've, we've talked a bit about segmentation and different types of segmentation techniques. Uh, from thresholding to pixel classification. And we know that segmentation is how we turn uh, the image stack into the label stack. And we've had just a little bit, just a heads up kind of about the pre and post processing aspects um, that are available once we have our label stack. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Dina Gratley, who will uh, share her screen and show you how to use a visa and elastic to actually do these segmentations and do these uh, pre and post processing. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Dina Gratley. I am a visualization scientist. Um, my expertise is in uh, 3D reconstruction and VR. I'll be showing you today just a quick overview of how 
we do 3D reconstruction. Um, so let me first share my screen. All right. Um, so what is 3D reconstruction in this case? Like Glendon explained in the in his presentation earlier, it's that we're moving from images into 3D models or 3D surfaces. And we came up with our own workflow in the lab. We use a viso and elastic, and we go back and forth between those two tools. And to do, today I am going to show you what is the fastest way of doing uh, segmentation. Um, this, of course, will help you. It's, it's a semi-automated automated, uh, uh, way of um, um, segmentation, and it will help you get your results in a faster way, hopefully. So the pre-processing, first of all, we get the image stack. So they get the um, uh, Z stack, the images. We prepare them in Aviso. We do image filters. We crop the data. We do the, the so pre-processing part is here. And then we move on to the segmentation part where it's we use elastic. In elastic, we do the labeling, uh, where we label different objects in different layers in, in, in elastic. And then the labeled images, the stack, the new stack, we bring them back into a viso and we do the uh, generate the surfaces. And there where we can do the uh, the post-processing where, where we can get volume information, volume data. So this is what we're going to cover today. We're going to do uh, a, a viso, a bit of a viso. We're going to import new sequence in, do a bit of volume rendering, isosurface, and image processing. So this is the preparation part. Move into Elastic, import the new stack, and train the software where we get the new labels and bring it back to Aviso. So I am using Aviso uh, version of 9.3. I assume that, uh, I don't know if, I assume most of you um, have maybe Aviso or not. And um, I am using the older version here. And what we're gonna do in our, um, in, in, in today's demo is that we're gonna cover the software overview Import the new stack, import new stack, new slices, and do a bit of uh, volume rendering and image processing. And then we're going to export the image sequence. Okay, so uh, let's get started. Okay, I'm going to run a viso now. I'm going to share a different screen. Okay, so this is the start page. And um, here you can see that it has recent data where we can open our recent data that we have recently opened, recent projects and create new project. And this is it, so this is the start page. And over here is the project pay, project view. If I click on it, I get a new project. And this is the interface. Here's the project view, properties view, and the viewer window. And those are the toolbars, that, that, the tool, that, that those are the tools that we're gonna use when we import the data. I'm gonna, I have already prepared the data and um, like you, like mentioned, like Glendon has mentioned uh, before, is that we have the uh, cropped um, rock sample on our wiki page. And I believe it's on the, it's here, uh, saved in the chat. You guys can load the data later and walk through the tutorial so you can practice the, with this hands-on session. So I have the uh, open, um, I'm gonna open the data. I have it already saved on my machine. And I'm gonna load the DICOM files, not the TIFF, the TIFF files, the DICOM, because I wanna show you what we do with the original data, raw data. Click on open. I've selected all, shift select all or control all. And here I get this DICOM loader. Um, it gives you information about the, the data that you're loading. First of all, I forgot to mention that this is a CT scan, a CT scan that was um, provided from uh, Amperk. Um, they've actually used the medical CT scan here at, the, at KMC to acquire the, the image stock. So this is the information that, uh, that comes with the data already. And here are the number of, of images. Move down. 
Okay, I'm gonna click on okay. So what Aviso does is that it automatically, as soon as I load the data, it attaches an ortho slice to this, but I'm gonna delete it for now. And I am gonna look at the data. This is the, the, the image stack that we just loaded. So in the project view, if you click on it, this properties window comes up and some information shows up. So here we get information about the, the data. It's 512 by 512 by 289. It's a 16 signed grayscale image. And we have the voxel size, all the information about what we just loaded. I'm gonna talk a bit about the interactions and how we navigate in our scene. So over here, we have some tools that we are going to use and they're really useful. This is the select tool. This is a track wall tool and the translate pan. This is the zoom button. Maybe I should just put a bounding boss box so you can see what, um, This is a rotate tool, again, trackball, just to rotate the scene. And I find this a really useful tool. If, for example, I like this view and I wanna save it, I can click on this icon here, which is set home and it will save that viewer, it will, save, it will save that view for me. And if I change it, if I go and look back and into a different angle, and if I go back, if I slip, click on the icon over here, the home, it will take me back to what I had saved originally. And then we have here different uh, orthographic screw, uh, views, X, Y, uh, X, Z, and Y, Z. And over here, this is a, a very useful um, viewer too. We have four different windows. I'll show you um, an example why this is. Um, so I can I can look at it from I can look at. The, uh, the object from different angles and different views. Okay. These are just, th th these are shortcuts uh, of um, the mouse buttons and what they can do. Instead of selecting the tools over here, you can do them with your mouse. You can look at those later. Um, I usually use the trackball because it's the easiest uh, tool, I mean, to navigate through the scene. And then I switch between uh, whatever tool that I need with the shortcuts. So I'm switching between my, between the presentation and Aviso. So you guys are aware of uh, where I'm, I'm um, what I'm doing. So the next thing we're going to do is, uh, before we do anything, is file and save the project. I'm going to go file, save project as. And over here where it says save as type, I'm going to change that to save uh, pack and go. When I click the save pack and go, it actually saves all the modules, all the data, everything in one folder. So when I open my project and reload it, I won't get any errors. Let me save this as, um, another thing that I wanted to mention uh, that didn't show up here is that you will always, you want to click on minimize project computation. Instead of uh, minimize project size, you click on this, select that. All right, so now we're gonna move on to a, the seeing the data and visualizing it. Okay, 
So the first thing that you want to do is that you want to read the images, look at the images, visualize them. Um, and the quickest way of doing that is uh, you attach an ortho slice. And how you do it here is, first of all, you click on the, the data, which is the object here. And you right click. And you select ortho slice and hit create. And over here, as you can see, an image viewer comes up, it shows up. If I click on the ortho slice, the properties window shows up, comes up. And um, let me explain a bit about, about this. If I click on this orange box, select it, it turns it on or off. And, the or and over here is the orientation, whether I want it, I want to see the, the ortho slice in XY or XZ or YZ. I can select the different orientation. And over here, this slider will go, will slice through the, 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 uh, the data, the whole data set, the image stack. And over here, this is a color map, it's a grayscale image. And what I will do is I'll change and adjust the range to the data window. If I do that, it will, it will select the right range, the correct range of, of this uh, uh, image sequence. Now, as you can see, if I, slide, if I, if I go through the uh, images, I can see it, it's a much clearer contrast, better quality, and I can see the data better. Okay, let's say I want to attach another ortho slice or two more ortho slices. I will right click again on the data and click on ortho slice. Now I have ortho slice two. I can change the orientation to X, Y, um, X, Z. Adjust the range again. Data window. Right click on the data and click on ortho slice and change it to YZ. Adjust the range to data window. Over here I have all of views. Okay, and Let's say I want to move the ortho slices. I want to move them all together. I can do is I can select the first ortho slice, the second one, and the third one, and click on this button over here where it says uh, it's, it's a linking button. I can link all of um, those ortho slices together. And I will move the slice number to zero for each. Now, uh, sorry, how do you select multiple ortho slices? So you shift select the first ortho slice, the second, and the third one. Thank you. You shift select them. Okay, and now I will, um, if I want to connect, so let's say I want to connect those ortho slices, I will click on the first slice number and drag it. to the slice number, to the second, to the ortho slice two, and then click on the, third, the, the second ortho slice number and drag it with the left, house, the left mouse button and drop it on the slice number to connect those ortho slices together. And now if I move my slider, 
I'm actually moving them all together. And as you can see here, you can see that, you know, you can find interesting parts of your, um, of your data. So uh, one thing just to explain is that um, the data, the data range usually is, it comes with the data. You know, the, the user usually knows the voxel size and um, the intensity range, um, or you can find it, it comes, it's, it's come, it comes stored within the data itself. I usually change the transparency to binary, so I can uh, get rid of the the black uh, mask or um, for each of them. You can see it as a as a whole object. Okay, so now let's move on. This is the ortho slice module. And now we're going to move on to uh, a quick way of visualizing the volume. We're going to add a, a volume renderer. OK, um, I want to get rid of my bounding box. I don't want it anymore. And I'll get rid of one of the, uh, I'll keep one ortho slice here. Keep this one. OK, now to add a volume rendering, I'll, I'll, you click on the, um, the data, again, the same way, and you right click, and you find volume rendering. You can always type here, the module. So volume rendering, and then hit create. This is, a, this is a quick way of visualizing and, and seeing your whole volume. So if I move on, I have two, I, two, two, two um, icons or, uh, or settings um, that comes with the, with, the, with the volume rendering. If I click on the volume rendering, the bottom one here, um, here I can change the color of, the, of my volume, even though it's a grayscale, but I can say I want to change it to a vol -ren. And I can change that color. And I can change the opacity with the uh, slider over here. If I click on the slider and drag it, I can make it more transparent. Uh, I'm not sure if this is very, um, if you guys can see it as well. I go all the way down, it becomes transparent. Okay, um, take it back. To one. And now, let's say I'm interested in this region only. I, I want to look at this area. What I, what I can do is I can attach a region of interest, ROI, region of interest box. And let me just align it 
maybe this view is, um, let's say I'm, well, I'm interested in this part. I'm gonna use my select tool over here. As you can see, those are the manipulators. Those are the green boxes that I can drag each side. And now if I, so this is the area that I'm interested in. So now if I go to the volume rendering settings and you find, if you, if you see here uh, where it says ROI, region of interest and no source, we have, we've made a new, bo a new box, yep. So you click on it and you attach it. You attach the volume rendering to that region only. Get rid of the um, ortho slice. Okay. Another quick way of visualizing the data is that we could attach an isosurface module to the to the, the image stack. So uh, let me hide the line rendering. Go away and hide the region of interest box. And right click on the rock and attach a, an ISO surface. Type in ISO, we'll get the ISO surface module. Okay, right here, you see as soon as I clicked it, nothing came up, and that's fine. Because in, in the ISO surface, um, we have to hit apply. Do you know we don't see your screen? Sorry? We don't oh, see your screen. Oh, I didn't change it. Okay. Sorry. Thank, you. Thank you. All right. So um, I will do it. I'll do it one more time. So you uh, click on the rock, you right click, and we can type in ISO surface, ISO surface. And here in the properties window, you can, you'll find that there are different, um, so, you know, there are different data here, different information. So threshold and uh, draw style shaded, um, or lines, points, I usually keep it to sh unshaded. Um, if I hit apply, you'll get the ISO surface. Over here, the threshold value is, is basically the, uh, um, it's the value of the ISO line that will, the, that will, the Avisa will compute and it will draw the surface of that value. So if I click on the auto refresh here, and I just want to show you quickly, if I change the, um, the, the threshold value, you can see that the uh, surface changes. With it, if I want to change the color of the ISO surface, I double click. I double click on this, which is the color map. Double click on that this window over here. Let's say I want to make it blue. Click on the color or change it, whatever um, color I want. 
and hit OK. There, we can change, you've changed it. So the reason I'm showing you that this is is because this is just a quick way for you to just to test your data, see how big your data is, uh, what it, what does it look like? But of course, this is not a it's not segmentation. You're not segmenting your data. You're just looking at it, visualizing it. And um, as you can see here with this data set, th this is a rock sample, and there are voids and maybe different materials that the scientists are um, interested in uh, labeling and and and. Um, you know, getting different objects of, of this rock sample to analyze it. So they will, it, it requires segmentation. Okay, so Let's say I like, I want to, um, extract a sub volume, just a small region. Again, like we did with the, with the um, region of interest box, but I want to extract it as a new volume so that I can do my image processing, filters, and everything, prepare those stacks to do a proper segmentation. Um, I will click on the rock sample, right click, and type in extract subvolume, extract. Over here, I get this output. I want to get, I'll turn off the ISO surface and I'll turn on the uh, volume rendering back again. Maybe um, not the region of interest though. Have it just, um, I want to see the whole volume. Okay, and now I get a new box, the blue box over here. This is the extract sub volume module. And in the same way as I did with the region of interest box, I can move the box to an area, to a region. And um, let's say I like this part over here because it has uh, voids and um, if I look at it, let me just change the opacity a bit. So I can see what I'm looking at, move it, move the, I'm dragging, I'm just dragging the, the boxes. And let's say I, I'm interested in this part. Over here, just this section of the rock seems interesting. Okay. You can always change the size by typing. You can all by typing in the numbers. Um, I usually just use the the, uh, the select tool and drag the box. All right, now that I've selected the region, I have the box around the region that I want, I can click on apply, just click on apply. And here we are gonna get the new output. This is just the cropped region. I'll, um, hi I'll hide the, uh, the volume because this volume render is attached to orig the original rock sample. So with the new cropped one, I'm gonna click on and get a new ortho slice. Ortho slice is here. And this is the region that I cropped. So 
let's say that this is what I'm, I want to segment, just this part, work on it, label the, the, the objects. Again, I can uh, change the range. All right. Let me just show you this. So now we're going to move on to um, image processing. Now that we've selected the region, I've selected a small region here. Um, of course, depending on your data, you can select the region that you're interested in and, and crop it, crop, crop that data. Um, and um, now I'm going to attach a filter sandbox. But I'm going to select my new output, the new cropped rock. Right click on it and type in sandbox, filter sandbox, comes up. And here is my um, output, the filter sandbox is down here. Let me just show it down, filter sandbox. <clears throat> uh, the reason I like to, to use this tool is uh, because it shows you on a smaller, on, on like a smaller part of the of the image what filter what what the filter is is going to um, what, what it's doing and what is changing. Um, I have to select tool, select it. Okay. So this is the filter sandbox, and I'm I'm selecting it. I'm I'm in the properties window, and here I'm I'm moving the slices. Um. Over here, I can change the filter type. Right now, I don't have any filter that is attached to the. Um, the sandbox, if I click on different, the different uh, um, filters, let's say Gaussian here, uh, if I change it, I think it's showing the other other slides. I don't want it. Let me move, I'm gonna move the, uh, the filter here and change that. If there's a subtle change, I am not sure if you guys can see it. If I do, again, none. Click on bilateral. Just a little bit. It removes a bit of noise here. I usually use the non-local means. So with this box, you're just changing a small portion, but if I hit on apply, it will change, it will, it will filter the whole image, the image sequence. And I'll get a new output, output, which is here. I'm gonna hide this ortho slice and my new filtered output of attach it to a newer ortho slice, which is this over here. So this is my filtered image. Again, just change the range. All right. Okay. Um, so then, uh, so now that we have the image stack and it's uh, filtered, prepared, um, 
what we can do uh, when we what we want to do is we want to export the image stack and bring them into our elastic to do the label labeling so now that i have the images prepared and filtered um I need to convert the image type. If, if, I, if I try to export this, it won't work as PNGs because we need to save them as the 8-bit uh, uh, images. And I'll right click, undo, and, and click on convert image type. And then over here, uh, what I was saying before is that the help module is really useful. You know, if you click on any of the modules and uh, you want more information about them, you just click on the question mark icon here and it gives you um, all the information that you, you need to know about whatever module you're loading. For this one, um, the convert image type, we're gonna go with 8-bit unsigned but as you can see here, the 8-bit unsigned is clipped. And to do this right, we need to get the right scale number and the right offset number. And the way you do this is that if you click on the question mark, the, the, the help, is that you get the formula here of the scaling and how you do it. Do you have the your input? Um, um, your max, where is it? Yeah, out max minus the out min, in max minus the in min. You divide, you divide those, and then you get the, and then you know you plug in the the, the right number of your yeah, um, um, your numbers in, so you can get the right offset. So I've done this calculation. And um, I'll just open. My other project. If I do. This. So this is, I've done this before. Uh, this is the same file, but I've just I've done the conversion here. Um, this is the, 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 the number, the scale and the offset numbers. And then after you convert the image type, you click on apply, you hit on apply and you get a new output. This is the output, the cropped new, uh, uh, new, new rock um, uh, images. And then if I click on the, the uh, rock, the, the, this new output, right click on it and hit on this icon here, it's the save button. If I click on that, this will export data as Um, you know? Yes. Sorry, uh, can you give us the value you use for scale and offset so we can also export uh, on our side? Yes, sure. So it's on the, uh, it's, you can see it's in your, um, the tutorial. It's 0. Point, I'll give it to you. It's uh, 0. 0.0439 and 3024. Or sorry, 0. 0.04324 uh, in yours, in your tutorial. And the offset is 3024. Thank you. Yes? Yeah, all done. Thanks. Okay, so um, now that I've cropped, uh, sorry, now that I've converted the images, what um, I'm going to do is save the data as. We're going to save them as a new sequence, new images. And um, 
I've already done that, but I'll just do it quickly here. This is a test. Create a new folder, just right click, uh, find it or save it somewhere where you can find, easily find and save as type. You wanna change that to PNG, move to um, PNG and hit save. Okay, um, my slices were small, so it just took seconds and it exported it. It could take longer for you, depending on, uh, on uh, of course, the size of, of your data. But, okay. Um, now that we, uh, we have already exported the image stack, we're gonna move on to elastic. All right, so I'm gonna move on to uh, segmentation elastic. And this is what we're gonna cover. We're gonna import our new image stack that we already cropped and filtered. Show you a bit of the, uh, the uh, interface, uh, Elastic's interface, and um, I'm gonna select features, do the training, and then finally export the images so that we can bring them back to Aviso. And this is what I'm using with Elastic version 1.3. Um, <clears throat> okay, I'm running Elastic. I'll bring it up. I will come up in a minute. Okay, so this is this is when I um, ran uh, Elastic, and this is the the interface um, that first shows up. Um, and what we're going to do is uh, we are going to look at the pixel classification today. So to create a new project, create new project under pixel classification, click on that and uh, save your project. Yeah, you need to uh, find the, the place where you want to save it through the construction. Elastic. I'll just say my project one. Say so right now. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to import the new data, the raw data in, and uh, where it says here add new, I'll click on that and add a single 3D or 4D volume from sequence. And I'm going to select the whole directory, choose. I have it here saved as image sequence. That's the folder. It's just gonna drag all the images that are in that folder. Select folder. And over here where it says stack across, we're gonna change that to Z and click on okay. Okay, now we can see that uh, the images are imported and I have four different views. This is the Z direction, X and Y. If I click on this um, arrow button here, this is how I can change my uh, um, stacks or I can click on the uh, middle mouse button or the, the roller on the, on, the, on the mouse, and you can scroll through your images in each orientation. And over here, you can change and, uh, and uh, rotate the images. And to zoom, you click on I always uh, forget this. You can change this. You can zoom with your uh, middle mouse button again. It's control and the middle mouse button to zoom in.
If you want just a single view, you can click on this square over here to maximize this view. If you want to go back to the four views, you click on the square again, which shows the, the four views, you click on it. Okay. So we did the navigation, imported the images, and now we're moving to um, the image selecting, uh, selecting so the features. Okay. Um, now that we have the images imported, we move to um, the feature selection tab and click on the select features, select features. And I'm just gonna go ahead and select everything, the color intensity, edge, texture, just move on and hit okay. Now that I have the uh, the feature selection select, uh, selected, I can move on to training. Okay. And this is where the training happens. So label one, let's call this. If I double click on it, I can rename the label. Let's call this drop. And then label two will be the voids. And let's add another label to uh, cover the outer layer. Let's just call it. If, if I had more materials, I can add another label and rename it for whatever, um, like water or gas, or whatever it is. I'm just going to delete it because I don't want that label now. Okay, um, over here, these are the uh, the tools that we're going to use. This is the select tool. This is the brush tool. And over here, where you see where it says size, you can change the size of the brush. You can start with one, and biggest is 61. And here, oh, I clicked on, just delete this label. Over here is the eraser. Okay, so now let me start with the uh, with with the training. I'm on my rock layer, and as you can see here, uh, it changes the color to yellow. That's the brush uh, color, and that's going to label the rock. I'm just going to rename this to rock. Um, I'll make this size bigger. So now this is big. This is a rock. This surface is rock. Scroll a bit. So this is rock. And I think maybe that's enough. Move to voids. What's really nice about the about elastic is that you don't have to add too many um, labels or, or train. Um, because it will just detect it and then you can correct. Well, once you see, once you have uh, the uh, predict predictions showing, then you can correct. I'll show you now what, what I mean. Um, so let's say this is a void. I know this is a void. I can change the size of the brush to smaller size. Um, and here I know this, this is a void. Over here, maybe this is a void. And I want it to know that this uh, is the outside. This is the outer layer. Just a quick test. All right, now if I hit on live update, it will automatically detect those labels. 
I'm just gonna give it some time because you can see here it changed right away. I'm gonna zoom in. You can see that the yellow is the rock here, void. Yeah. This is how the this is how it's the segmentation. Um, looks like. Okay, now I can see, for example, that it took out this layer, the uh, the outside, um, which is air, just it's, it's basically void, but we want to, we want to fix that. So we click on this blue line and keep live updates on. Click on it here. Maybe a bit more and it will automatically just change that. You can see here. And over here, I know that this is a void. I can go here and click on the void, the layer, click that. And it, you can see that it just automatically adjusted it, the whole image. Over here too. What I'm clicking on, um, those icons or that's the eyes, the, um, those are the views where you can see. Here is the segmentation rock, clicking on it. This is the, the rock layer. Voids, the blue, this is the segmented. Voids, this is the outside layer. And those are the predictions. You can see that the predictions are the lighter color, the yellow, the light, light yellow, the yellow, light blue, and the red. Um, of course, you can see it because it's too dark. <clears throat> so let's say I am, I want to show you something. If I, if I made a mistake and um, this is the void, and so this is a void, for example. I'm going to go to rock. And I want to erase that stroke that I just made. Let's click on erase and change the size of the, of the eraser and just erase that here. So as you can see, this is really simple and it's, it's, it's a fast way of uh, doing the segmentation. Um, it's just a semi-automatic uh, way of, of doing it. Um, let's say I'm happy with this for now. Of course, you you know you could do the proofreading, make sure that this is correct. You you want to go over through the slices, make sure that they are that you've selected uh, uh, and labeled the right objects. But for now, I'll just say that this is what I am uh, happy with. So. I will click on the segmentation rock layer, this layer over here, and right click and hit export. I'm gonna get this window. Okay, so uh, we don't need the C axis. So C, there's nothing in there. Um, and we wanna change the format to PNG sequence, move to PNG sequence. And change the directory. You want to select a new directory. Um, let's say, I'll just save it. New Elastic. Let's use a lock. and hit OK. Elastic is uh, exporting the images now there. It's exporting the labels. 
Okay, so now I'm done. I finished. It's done. It's finished. So I can take back my images back into a visa. All right. Okay, so in the visa. There's one thing that I want to go back to my slides just to um, show you guys is that we need the voxel size. We need the voxel size. Um, and you need to write this down after you, you extract the sub volume. You want to go back to the sub volume that you just extracted and save that size, write it down somewhere. Because when you bring back um, your images, you don't want a visa to read them as one, one, one. You want the right size. So I'm just going to write this down. We're going to bring back the uh, the images. This is the old uh, file that we have uh, that we had already opened um, before. I'll just create a new project for this one. And um, I will go back to open data. And um, get my filtered elastic uh, images, elastic click on all uh, and open. And here, change the voxel size. This is where it's the voxel size is important. One point one nine five three. Okay. No. I'll actually import the ones that we just created just now. And it's um okay, click on those. All right, so this is my new labeled stack, the new image sequence. If I attach it to an ortho slice and see that um, this is my new segmented, it's a binary image, this is a new segmented uh, labels or, or image stack. And um, I will, I'd like to look at the surface and generate a surface from this. Um, what I'm gonna do is, I wanna show you something first before I, I do the conversion. If I do an isosurface, and hit apply, show me, that'll bring up this uh, surface. Let me just convert this, uh, um, convert image type to 8-bit label so that a visa will recognize that this is a, a labeled image. I already did. And on this output, the new output, the labeled image, if I right click and generate surface, I'll get this new window, that this new um, create surface. 
I'll, li I'll leave the, uh, uh, the settings as it is and just hit apply. You'll get a new output. With this new output, you right click on it and do a surface view. And here is my surface, the segmented surface. Um, there's one thing that is um, really, it's a nice feature um, where you can look at clipping planes and, and um, you can look at the, you know, as you move your slices, you can look at the surface too, same time. Um, I like to use this a lot. This is the clipping plane over here. So now we have segmented and we've generated a surface of this rock, uh, the cropped rock sample. And I can go back to elastic. So I can do the same thing with the different, with those different uh, labels. Like if, if, if I wanted to um, export the voids, I can do the same thing. I would do the same steps with each different object and then bring them back together in a visa in the same way. Um, so I could get the, the whole object. So it'd be the same thing here, PNG sequence. I'll just do this as a quick test. Um, select new elastic, I'll call, I'll name it. I'll have a new folder for this and just say void. <clears throat> Select that folder <clears throat> and export. Okay. That's doing it. Did it, did it. go back to Aviso and and uh, I have bring in the data, open data. Let me just share the my Aviso screen. I'm going to select all of the images, hit open. Here, change the size. All right, and this is my new one. This is the um, And here I will convert image type, convert the image type to H label, APID label, hit apply. And let me just get rid of this ortho slice. Generate surface, generate surface, hit apply. The, the, the thing is about the surface, generating surface, is that you have to remember to attach it to a viewer. You know, you might think, you know, okay, where is it? It's, you have to reattach attach it to an, a surface view so you can see it. Now I'll change the color. Oh, um, one thing it's, it's, I forgot to mention is the color surface view, changed it to red. If I go down here to my surface view and uh, click on, Normal, yeah. if I do constant, change this to blue. Here I'll get the voids with the rock sample. Voids and, and the rock surface. This is the quickest way of segmentation. And like I said before, this is, this is our workflow that we came up with um, to help you guys to segment um, in a quick way. You can do uh, segmentation in Aviso, but I find Elastic straightforward and really easy to use. Um, 
we can you can look at this is the segmentation tool um, or editor in, in Aviso, and those are the some of the tools that or algorithms that Glendon was um, um, has mentioned in his presentation. Um, and you can have a look at that, you know, afterwards, and you can play with it. Well, um, like I said, I, I prefer to use Elastic. It depends on on the uh, complexity of the data, of course. Yep, and and that's that's it. This is uh, how you do segmentation. Cool. So, Dina, thank you very much. That was absolutely wonderful. Thank that you. really covered the gamut of two tools and how they work together. And at this point, the people should be able to create their own segmentations and visualize them almost from start to finish. So what I want to talk about is whereabouts would you run this? Um, you know, on which machines could you use to do uh, pixel classifications and, and use a visa? As I mentioned before, and kind of use some of the pros and the cons of pixel classification is that the pros you've, you've seen, it's quite simple to do. You get a lot of mileage out of just a little bit of training. But the downside is that it requires a fair bit of memory and computation to do that more than, for example, simple thresholding. But, you know, you also can segment more types of, of images than you could with thresholding. So there's obviously a lot of compute resources at KAUST. Everyone has a laptop. We have had some amazing data sets segmented by Elastic on just on a laptop, you know, in 16 gigs. But that it was a small data set and the quality was just, you know, pristine. But the as the data sets get more reasonable in size and, you know, a laptop isn't going to cut it. And so there is a workflow that basically lets you run the sorts of pixel classification workflows on a large compute cluster. And so what we're basically going to do is, is kind of reinforce what you've seen with this pixel classification workflow. You will still need to do, you know, the training and understand how to extract some of the images and, and what the labeled data set is, but we're going to add this additional aspect to it that basically gives you access to a greater co compute, compute capacity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and we're going to start that, that process. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to walk you through it and give a demo of a 3D reconstruction pixel classification workflow that's going to work on the cluster. Part of this, we're going to talk about the pixel classification requirements, talk a little bit about IVEX, and then talk about the stages of this workflow, uh, how they will go back and forth between a workstation for interactive work and IVEX for batch processing. As I mentioned, pixel classification requires a lot of memory. You probably want more than 128 gigs on your uh, workstation. Um, 64 gigs, probably the minimum. Again, it depends on the stack size and, and the number of features that you want to extract. So one of the things that you saw Dina do is when she was basically selecting which features she selected all. Every feature you select was going to require more memory to uh, and more processing power to extract and process. But every different feature that we enable allows us to see some different aspect of the image. So we almost never uh, detract from our ability to do the segmentation by asking for more features, but we do incur a penalty in, in memory and compute costs. That's kind of why these numbers are, are, are fairly large. And it requires lots of CPU cores. So your laptop or even your desktop may only have four or eight cores. The, the workstations, the, 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 the nodes, the compute nodes on IBEX uh, may have 40 or 80 cores, just for comparison. Whereabouts should we run this? As I mentioned, laptops and desktops aren't going to cut it. 16 gigabytes, 32 gigabytes of a desktop won't be enough. Now, a lot of people do have workstations, and some of them are quite beefy and, and substantial. They may have many cores, 16 or 30 cores or more, but not everyone has you know, a top-of-the-line workstation. And sometimes with these workflows, a researcher collects a data set, needs to segment them to begin the analysis. And once that segmentation is done, they don't need to kind of revisit that. There's, you know, they don't need to continually segment a new image text. So 
it doesn't make a lot of sense to get you know a really expensive beefy machine just for that one part of uh, the research project and that's where it comes in they provide remote workstations so if you go to the url below which is kind of is my workstation my ws.cows.edu.sa you can access a substantial workstation it's shared with other people but they have between 500 and a ter gigabytes and terabyte of ram um, they have 40 or more cores and it's available through your browser and i'm going to use that today for my interactive sessions anyone who has uh, unix privileges for their coast account already should be able to connect to those machines directly if you can't raise a ticket with it so it help desk at, at coast and um, and ask for them for help for setting you up the one of the things to keep in mind is that the resources that are there are shared so you know sometimes it does get busy other people are running fairly intensive jobs, but for the most part, there's enough leftover resources available and for work like the elastic workflow, where a lot of it is, you know, interactive and you don't really get the, you know, the big compute until you're doing like the final um, extraction, the final write of the data, and maybe a little bit as you do the live updates, as you make changes. So sharing those resources is, is rarely an issue and the nice thing is that because you can save your your your, se your session stays around until you log out if you have to go for lunch you're not going to lose your work or have to reload your your project and that you just uh, keep it there so ibex ibex is an hpc high performance computing cluster um, it's a shared resource but it's a batch processing. So it's not for interactive work, it's for batch processing compute. So why would we want to use IBEX? Well, for one thing, Elastic supports a batch processing mode and IBEX has lots of memory and compute power. And so we can kind of combine these together to get the best of all worlds. So to get onto IBEX, you will want to SSH into an iLogin node, that's the Intel uh, login nodes. So, you know, there's G login for the GPU nodes, and, but we won't use that. The Elastic is on the, the um, Intel nodes. If you want to get more help and understanding about how to use IBEX, the best place to start is with the KSL uh, webpage, their training webpage, and look at the latest uh, IBEX 101 training workshop. There'll be slides and videos that you can uh, watch if you haven't already attended that training. And that will help you with how to get onto IBEX and find your, your way around. Let's start out with pixel classification. Uh, where does it begin in this workflow? It begins on IBEX where your data is. So I'm going to assume that your data is somewhere either in uh, slash IBEX scratch under your um, username or under IBEX projects if you have a project there. What you will need to, to do to make this work is that you're going to have to load the Elastic module. When you, once you do that, not only will Elastic be available, but also a bunch of other tools, uh, custom tools that we have written that all begin with PIX class. And if you type in like PIX class and then just tab a few times to autocomplete, it will actually show you all the commands available in this workflow. And you can find more information and more documentation available at, at the README file located at the path above. So, yes. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to create a training project. So you saw Dina as part of her Elastic workflow. She created a new project, a pixel classification project. And that project contained all of the image stack. So, so if you have a large image stack, that would be a very large project and training would, you know, the live update would, would take longer. So what we're going to do is we need to create a project for training, but we're not going to put all of our image stack into the project, only some of it, enough to give kind of a sample of, of what image stack is about. Now, when you choose this subset of your image stack. You want it to be a representative sa a sample. So if you have, for example, 
uh, an object that only appears in the very middle, you can't just get the start of your image stack. And in the example that we'll show you, we're going to grab a little bit from the beginning, a little bit from the middle, a little bit from the end, so that every object that we're trying to segment out appears in a representative way. And also getting from the beginning to the end, we're trying to account for uh, possible variations in intensity values. But really, you should have normalized the stack before you started working with it. The process on Ibex starts with creating this training project. You will want where, wherever your you'll want to create a directory to work with these projects, and you'll want to soft link to wherever your image stack comes from. The reason being is that when you work with this workflow, you will of course need the original image stack. You will create this training project, uh, which we will see how to use interactively shortly. And then when we do the segmentation, you'll end up with a folder of segmented files and a bunch of log files and some other files. And so it really helps to keep them together under one project. Um, but you don't want to copy the original data files, the original image stack to this new location. That's a waste of space. And that's where the, the, the soft link comes in. So you will make a, a new project directory in Ivex Scratch or Ivex Projects. You will CD into that project directory. Then you will create a soft link to wherever that original path was to the original image stack and uh, link it to the current directory. What I've done here is give you a chance to kind of give it a new name. If you just, instead of um, image stack, if, if you replace that with dot, it would give it the same name as given in the original path. Um, but here's a chance to rename it something simpler, like maybe just, you know, stack. Then the next thing that we will do is we will run one of these helper scripts that was enabled when we loaded the Elastic module, which is PIX class create projects. And it takes two arguments of, of interest for us. Uh, by the way, there is help. It, it, there's some other options and it does provide help uh, as, as well. But these are the two main ones that will get you going. The first is the stack specification. And the other is kind of the index of image ranges of IDs uh, or indexes in the image stack that you want to use for training. So that's the, the dash T. What will happen is when you run this, provided that you're in the directory and there's a stack name folder that's, that's been linked to that has a bunch of images, and those images are things that Elastic understands, like PNG or TIFF then it will create a training project for you. And it, it's, and it has a special name, and that name is going to be PIX class training, the stack name, and .ilp, which is Elastic Project. So I'm going to go and run this and show you, and then we'll talk a little bit about what these arguments actually uh, stand for and some kind of caveats and, and, and what, the, what they mean. What does the dash S and the dash T mean? So with that, I'm going to start from uh, logging into, into Ibex. And I'm going to go to my it's Ibex Scratch. Going to want to do now is load the Elastic module. So if I go module AV, Elastic, that'll show me what's available. Okay, so this is Elastic version 1.3.0. There is a Elastic 1.3.3, which is the newest in this particular stable range. And that's the 1.3.3 is the version that IT has. And there's a little wrinkle there when, we, we, when it'll upgrade the project. So that version is just something to keep in mind. And so I'm going to load or just add that module. So add Elastic. And now I see that Elastic is loaded. And now if I type in PIX class and do a tab complete, I see that I have access to a bunch of these new PIX class uh, scripts. That's going to come in handy shortly. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make my directory, which is, I'm going to call it Elastic PIX class demo uh, for, make that blank. And I'm going, to, I'm going to go into that directory. Okay. Thank you. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, link the 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 stack that I have someplace else. I, I should, what I'm going to get is this uh, rock cropped TIFF, which is the the data set similar to the one that we're working with today, um, except it's saved out in TIFF as opposed to PNG. Either one of those file formats is good to work with. So a slides show PNG. PNG is more commonly available. People are familiar with it from the web. It has uh, great features. TIFF is also great too for these types of images. I'm going to just copy it here as stack. So if I look at my directory, there's a link to it. And if I look what's in there, I will see that there's a whole bunch of TIFF files. I also see that this, there's some other files that are not TIFF. So when I point Elastic to this directory, I don't want it to read all the files because some of them are some, some in, info files. I just want just the TIFF files and that will come up uh, shortly. So I go to text class, tab complete and create, create projects. The first one was dash S, which was the stack specification. I'm going to need this in quotes. And the other thing is I need to specify which files. And I'm also going to do this in quotes as well. So those are TIFF. The reason that the whole thing is in quotes, even the, the glob, this like all asterisks, is because this specification is not for bash. We don't, we're, not, we're not asking bash to find all of these files. We're asking Elastic. We're telling Elastic, this, this is, these are the files to look for. That's why the whole thing is in quotes. But the cool thing is that you can tab to complete and it will, it will help you find these. Um, but it, you should know what sort of files are in your directory first. And then the T uh, for you know, the training data that we're going to extract out, I'm going to have starting from the beginning from, from you know, the zeroth index, I'm going to get 25 uh, images from there, from the middle of the stack. So 0 0.5 way, the way through, I'm going to get another 25. And from counting backwards from the end, I'm going to get another 25 images. And when I do that, the script runs, Elastic does, does a little bit of magic, and the project file will be created. And when this is done, okay. So it's giving us a bunch of information. You can ignore the warnings. So Elastic itself generates some warnings. They're usually on the um, you know, command line and, or for the developer. They don't show up in the GUI because we're in the command line, they show up for us. Ignore those. But there are some outputs from our creation script that tell us a little bit about the image stack and what it thinks about it. So what it said here is that the RAM requirements, it's going to make a guess at them. It's just making some estimates as to how much RAM this is going to need uh, based off of you know, some sort of safety factor. So it's going to choose to kind of how to break the, the problem up so that it fits on the nodes uh, without running into into out of memory issues and things like that. It estimates that basically we will use half a meg of memory per block uh, that it's kind of uh, chunked this into. And it's created our training project. And if I look here, I see PIX class training stack dot ILP. Okay, let me just cover the two arguments to this create command in a little more detail. And just so you know that, that some, some information is available about them in the slides for future reference. So dash S is the stack specification. So the stack is that directory. It's the directory that contains your image stack. And you have to specify which glob for which files to select from that directory. And so typically we want all the image files and we can use whatever that original image is, either PNG, TIFF, or you know, sometimes TIFF is TIFF. And we have to put the glob in quotes again, uh, because the specification is for Elastic and not for Bash. The next thing is the training slices. And the format for it is basically slice range, comma, slice range, comma, slice range, as, as many as, as you need. And, and for example, the one that we saw was you know, 0, colon 25, comma. There's that comma that separates out the slice range, 0. 0.5, colon 25. That's the, that's the second slice range comma, uh, negative one, colon 25. That was the third slice range. And so the slice range is itself split into two parts. The start index, 
and the number of images to select for this range um, separated by a colon. And so if the start index is a positive number, it means counting from the beginning or kind of an offset from the beginning. If it's a negative number, it's an, an offset or a count from the end going backwards. If the number is an integer, then it refers to an image index or offset. If it's a float, it's talking about a fraction of the image stack. So point, 0 0.5 is like halfway through the stack. So the nice thing about this is that this stack was very small. It had like, you know, 170 images in it. Your full stack may have a thousand or 2000. And so instead of having you calculate the actual indices, you can just know, like, I want something a quarter of the way through or halfway through three quarters of the way through that sort of thing. The number, uh, which is the, the, the count or, or the number of images to select is it's an integer. Now we have created our training project and we need to do the training. Uh, so the training project was created for us on IVEX, but to train it, we need to run it in a place where we can inter interact with the, with the Elastic GUI. And that's not uh, IVEX. That's going to be the remote workstations. So we're going to go to that, the remote workstations. Mm -hmm. But how do we connect to the IVEX file system. So it's not mounted there. Uh, Shaheen is mounted and it would be available immediately, but IVEX isn't. So we're going to take advantage of the fact that IVEX exports its file system via SMB or Samba, which is, is a kind of a remote file system technology. What we're going to, what we can do is from the terminal in the workstation, we can basically just open up an URL as an SMB or Samba URL. And what will happen is that a file manager window will appear. We can then go to the, that mount point and we will open the IBEX scratch folder, which is basically slash IBEX slash scratch. Um, if your files were on slash IBEX slash project, then you would go to probably to IBEX underscore projects. It's going to ask you for a password and so you'll ha you have to put that in. Um, you will connect as yourself. The default value should be whoever you are. And the domain needs to be coast. So you have to change that because it comes up with, with the wrong domain by default. So the domain needs to be changed to coast. And then you can specify, remember your password until logout. Now we're not done. <laughs> we have mounted that particular folder, but it gets mounted in a very odd location. It's based off of your coast ID, and it has a whole bunch of strange characters in it, like colons and things like that, 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 that come from the kind of the strange way that this file system is mounted through SMB. The problem with using this file system directly is that Elastic, when it goes to process file paths, is looking for some special characters that mean certain things, um, like you know, globbing of files and things like that, and file ranges. And so it doesn't like the special uh, path that SMB mounts. So what we need to do is basically create a link to that path through a nicer name. And so we're going to basically create a link to this strange IVEX SMB mounted IVEX scratch to a local directory that we'll just call IVEX scratch. And the nice thing then is that it will basically be home, your username, IVEX scratch, and then your files. And that way, Elastic is happy. So you'll, you'll change you know, into, into these directories, and then you're ready to work. Now, every time you go to the, a new IT remote workstation session, you will have to remount the file system. But you won't have to create a new link. Uh, I think that every time you mount it, it ends up at the same mount point, and your link will persist. So you don't have to do this step, at least the, the soft link. Uh, every time. So at this point, we're ready to run Elastic. So I'm going to save that. And we're going to, I'm going to show you this step right here. Okay. So here I'm at the, the main uh, My Workstation interface where you can see what, what hosts are available. And you can see how much memory they have and how much they're used. Lots of compute resources available. I will go and start a new Ubuntu service. And here we go. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to open up a terminal and I'm going to, so the URL for this is going to be Samba 
5 of x coast of the u of s a. Okay, and up comes this window. And here is I've x scratch. Voila. Okay, so it's it's actually loaded all the way in. Let me go and just double check that this is actually working. I have already created my soft link directory. So if I go I've x, I, I place it under this directory here, remote. And so so here you can see how I linked Ibex Scratch to this very kind of long, you know, slash run. This, this, it's a long path, but if you use tab to complete, you'll be able to create that, that soft link. So I'm going to go into Ibex Scratch. And I see my directories. So I had previously created one called Elastic Picks Class Demo 4. So I'm going to go there. If I look at my files, I see that I see my stack directory and I see my pixel classification project. Now we are on the remote workstations. They have their own module system and their own version of Elastic. So their version is 1.3.3. I'm going to use it. If you want, if you go to the Elastic web page version 1.3.0 is still there and it's very easy to install it's just um a tarball you get it you extract it and you, you're print, you're ready to go uh, but i'm going to use the one that's here so if i go module av elastic so that's for available i see the elastic that's here even though i'm at a terminal i'm not at the terminal for ibex Right, so this this is not the not the ibex i login node or whatever. This is the remote workstation, and there's different modules here. But I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to load it. So I'm going to go a module add elastic. It looks the same, and it's loaded. Now we don't have the pix class stuff here because that's part of the workflow for the batch side. But what I can do is I can go run elastic. And kind of ignore the warnings that are coming up on the, the terminal, but the Elastic application is going to load. And what I'm going to do is I'm now going to browse the files and I'm going to go to my new Pix class demo four, and I'm going to load and open up this image stack. And, and as we see here, we're, we are now in Elastic and ready to do the training. So let me just go back to my slides. We have already got the file system mounted. We have run Elastic. We are now in our session. So if you do go back a second or third time, you will have to, if you're going to back to a different session, um, you'll have to mount the SMB IVEX scratch, but you won't have to create that directory. But every time you go in, you will have to kind of start off your session by going into this IVEX scratch directory, wherever you've put it. You uh, load the Elastic module or add it run underscore elastic dot shell is kind of how you start it. Up comes the GUI, and now we're ready to do the training. So just a refresher on what we're going to do. We're going to open that PIX uh, class training stack name ILP, the, the, the project file. We're going to add labels and examples. So we're going to select the training pane. The feature selection has already been done for us. All the features were selected. The images that we uh, stack that we're going to use to train on is already added as well. Um, so we're going to click once for each object type. We're going, to, we're going to select two or three out of them. We're going to add the labels, paint the appropriate training labels on for each class, click live update to see what it's like, <clears throat> you know, repeat until we're satisfied. And then we're going to save the project and close the project out. Because we are using the same project that's on IBEX, when we save it out, it's going to be on IBEX as well, because this is the project that will seed our segmentation process. And then we can quit, we'll quit out of Elastic. There's a bit of a wrinkle here on the save project step because of the version, version mismatch, but I'll show you that when we get to it. So the input data has already been put in, it's already there. The features were already selected, so they're already there. So the 42 features were already select, selected, and we can see we can see the list down below of what they are. Now we're going to go to training. <clears throat> now it always gives us two labels to begin with, so I'm going to rename the first label. Let's call it rock. Let's call or let's call it outside uh, exterior rock. And I'm going to add another one. I'm going to call it void. 
Okay, so, and now begins the training. So for the exterior, I choose my brush and I'm gonna just drag around there. <clears throat> for the rock, I'm going to drag around here. And for the void, I'm going to select, this is part of the void, this is part of the void, this is that, that is two. It's getting a little bit narrow there, so I'm gonna make my brush a little bit smaller, just so I don't want to mistrain it and confuse it. Okay, so there's my training data, and now I'm gonna go live update. I'm gonna see what it thinks. So you can see at the bottom that it is um, doing some processing. Voila. Okay, so if I look at so let me just look at the segmentation. I'll turn off the uncertainty. By the way, that uncertainty can be very useful because it helps you know where you should train. So you can look for the areas that are most uncertain. There is a layer between the boundary and the void. It considers this outside part also to be part of the void. This is where maybe using a mask or some more training uh, might help. Actually, let me go, I'll go and fix that. I know how to fix that. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, well, you know, this part here, There we go, that looked a little bit better. Okay, sweet. So I'm now happy with this, and I want to use these trained features to do the segmentation. One other thing I just wanna mention here that's good about this workflow is if you have a lot of you know, incoming image stacks, let's say like in this case, this is for core sample, let's say you kept having core samples come in, you could use the same training set right? You don't have to keep retraining. As long as the image stacks that you create, the new ones are created by the same process, they have the same normalization, they have the same sizes and resolutions. As long as there's consistency between the different stacks, you only need to have like one training stack, and then you can use that to, to apply to all the other stacks that you have. This, it, it, this requires them all to kind of be consistent, but you don't have to you don't have to redo the training if you don't uh, if there's consistency there okay so now we're going to save the project and uh oh <clears throat> there's no save button because this version was updated was upgraded so the project file was up was upgraded but the old one can still read it and we can still use it for image processing so i'm going to do save project as it's already suggested a name for me as underscore two and perfect, I will save that. So I will wait until it comes back and it finishes the save. And now what I will do is I will quit. It worked last time, so let's do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just move the, the first text class one. And I'm gonna uh, just move this, the new version to be give it the same name as, as, as the previous version. So now we are done with the interactive portion of the training. So I'm back in the terminal that I had opened to IVEX. I do an L slash a, a listing here. I see that the, the project files that got written out previously. What I'm going to do is I'm now going to do my segmentation. For that, let's go to go to the slides. So before I go on to this, I just want to mention something about Elastic. It's an open source project, but it's an academic open source, and it's under continued development, adding you know, advanced new uh, research technologies to it. So what they do ask is that if you have used it as part of work on your papers, that you add a reference to Elastic. To get more information both about, about Elastic the pixel classification workflow itself and how to cite them for publishing, um, you can check the links there. Okay, so now we're going to go and start our segmentation on IVEX. 
So there's something called a PICS class status report, which is going to give us a little bit of information about how many nodes are available on IBEX um, to give us a sense of when our job will run, if it will run now or not. If it finds you know, log files from previous runs, it will also give us some information about, about the segmentation process, if, if it's still ongoing, if there's missing files, you know, if you had out of memory issues or some other things, issues with, with the processing, they'll show up here. You'll, we'll see that again uh, shortly. So that's, that's PIX class status report. The main one though, to start this is uh, PIX class segmentation. What you'll need to do is pass two arguments to it. In the first position will be the project file itself. And in the second position will be the, the stack specification. It's the same one you used before. And what will happen is that it's going to basically split up the work into a bunch of different jobs. It'll give you some information about how it split things up so that basically it tries to split up the work so that it doesn't require too much memory for each block of work or too much time. So it takes very small blocks, like 15 minutes. So it, it works well running in between other people's jobs. And this tends to mean that you get your job done faster too. After you run this, it will have launched a job for you and you can use SQ, uh, so Slurm Q, and dollar sign user is a variable name. Um, and that will just show the job that you have queued so that you can see that it's actually uh, running. And then we're going to wait until SQ says there's no more jobs left. So let's go, go back to, to IBEX. Okay, so we're back at IBEX. Let's try PIX class and there was status report. So there's only six nodes available at the moment. Um, it's not too many, but it should be enough. And it says that it's not able to find, you know, logs or things like that, but we're, we're gonna provide the information to it. So uh, later on, and the other was uh, PIX class segmentation, okay? So the first thing we need to do is pass in the training file. And the next thing is we need that stack specification. So that was uh, stack is the name of the directory. And then there were TIFF files, TIF, and that should be good enough. There we go. Okay, so we've submitted our jobs. It's given us some information about how it split them apart, suggestions about you know, how many threads and so it suggested 10 blocks and it estimates about two minutes running time. So let's run SQ dash user and then user and that's me. Okay, so now we actually see these jobs that are running. There's 10 of them somewhere around the minute mark or so that they should complete. So actually you can see there's fewer of them now, right? There's a few ones that have already completed, even less, only two left and they're all done. Great. So did it work? Let's see what's in the directory here. Okay, well, we see a bunch of log files. So for each one of those jobs, an, an out and an error log file was generated. And we also see at the top here, there's a directory called segmentation with a number after, and that number is the job number. So if I, if I look inside of it, oh, I see a bunch of PNG files. That, that looks kind of promising. Let's go and see what the slides say. There's a bunch of other tools that let us validate the, the results that we got out to make sure we aren't missing files in the sequence that our label uh, image stack is complete. The ones of, of interest are validate segmentation. And what we do is we pass in the seg that segmentation directory and the stack, and it makes sure there's a kind of a one-to-one -one correspondence. There's also PIX class status report, which we saw before, but this time, if we pass in the segmentation directory and the stack directory, uh, we will get a much more complete report. And the other thing that we can do is if we were missing files, we can run the job again, not as a complete job, but as an update where uh, we only run over ranges of the image stack that were incomplete. And so if we do PIX class update segmentation, you'll need to pass in the project file, just like you did for segmentation. You also need to pass in the image stack, just as before, but you also pass in the output directory, the segmentation output directory, the, the label stack. And with this, it will do kind of the minimum amount of work needed just to get um, everything updated.
we'll do that, but we'll see, we're gonna see something like, like this. Uh, we do a PICS class status report uh, with that segmentation directory and the stack. We're gonna get information like how many jobs there were that ran, um, how many su completed successfully, how many failed, how many were canceled or terminated. Um, that can be an indication that they ran too long or something like that, how many ran out of memory. There's also some runtime statistics telling us about how long the jobs ran for and, and how much memory they required. We can use that to debug issues where uh, we aren't getting the complete label stack. You know, we might need to, to, to run, to, to enable it so that the jobs can run for longer or, or have more memory or need to get split into smaller blocks and how many files are missing as well. So let's go. That was PICS class, status. In this case, we pass in our segmentation directory and we also pass in our stack directory and voila, here's our status report. So we see that the jobs took on the order of a minute each and because they all run in parallel, instead of waiting for like 10 minutes, we only have to wait for a minute. And we also see how much memory each one of them took, the maximum size, and we see that None of them are missing. There's no errors. Everything is good. Cool. Now we've got our image stack. Uh, what now? Okay. So now you've got results. So there's a reminder. Just cite Elastic again. Please do that uh, because they basically give their their tool away for, for free. So what happens if things go wrong? So if the issue is with Elastic itself and not with this workflow with Elastic. Um, there is a GitHub page and you can raise issues there. There are developers who to do work on it, but again, it's open source. So maybe you can contribute or, you know, even just filing a report for an issue may be of help. If the issues are with the PIX class tools themselves, this is we support. So the places to go are the local Coast GitLab. Um, there's something called Elastic Configs, and that's where these PIX class tools live and you can raise issues there and we will can help with that. You can also connect with us on Coast IBEX under Viz Data Science um, and um, we can connect this way or you can send an email to help at viz.coast, um, the usual help email address. If however your issues are with IBEX instead, you know, issues with um, you know, Slurm or access to directories or things like that, um, then what you need to do is uh, you can uh, contact them on Slack in the general channel um, or send uh, a request for assistance to ibex at hpc.coast.edu.sa. So that's the standard uh, ibex uh, support ticket route. The issue is that there's a bunch of different tools and responsibilities. There's the Elastic itself. There's the PIX class uh, workflow on IBEX, which, which we maintain. Um, and then there's IBEX itself, which another uh, systems team in KSL maintains. Um, so if you, just to help you know who to reach out to. Finally, we've got a segmentation. Let's just take a quick look at it, make sure we like what we've got. And um, so to do that, I'm gonna go back to the remote workstation. So if I look in my directory here, I will see the same view that I saw on IBEX, which makes sense because I'm mounting that file system here. So I see the log files, I see my segmentation directory. Um, and in fact, let me go here. This is my link to it. Let me go into the stack directory and or TIFF files. This was this was the image stack. And if I looked at if I look at one of those, um, so it's one of these, these filtered images. Um, if I go back up, however, to the, the segmentation folder that was just created. Now, if I go and look at it, I don't see anything, right? Why is that? Well, as was discussed uh, previously in, in, in Sean Medina, these are, are labeled images and the label numbers are very small. Let me just go and run Fiji. So Fiji's image J is a wonderful tool that's open source and free to install and easy to install. Just, you know, uncompress it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go and open this image stack. So if I go to file, I'm going to go to import. 
and I'm going to go to image sequence. And now I'm going to go to my demo three directory that I was just working on. I'm going to go into that segmentation directory and I just open up, up the first file. It, it kind of realizes there's a whole bunch more, asks me to, to import them. And there's my, there's my image tag, but it's the labels tag. So nothing appears, but what I can do is the following. I can go to um, image, adjust, brightness, contrast, and I'm gonna set the minimum to be zero and the maximum is going to be probably two or three. Okay, that's, so three, there we go. And now I can see, basically I can see, I can see the label stack there. So that's another way besides the, the way that Dina showed you using a viso. So basically it's just evidence that yes, the workflow worked and we did get our label stack out from uh, our, our training and the full data set that was there. So we only trained on 75 um, images, which is actually, uh, it, which would have been enough even for an image stack that had like a thousand or so, as long as it was consistent throughout. The interactive performance for doing the training is kind of what, what you've seen today, but um, because you're running on, uh, on IBEX, you can process um, significantly a, a larger image stacks and also in a short amount of time. So with that, I will conclude my session. You know, thank you very much. It's, it's five o'clock. I want to thank you very much for attending. I hope that uh, you will find that material here useful. Um, there is a feedback form that I would kind of share with you in the, the chat that I would be, um, would be grateful if you could fill out. This will help us in the future. Okay, I believe that is the link right there. If you could, you know, just, just fill it out, that will help us in the future for planning these for, you know, so that it knows what we should emphasize more, uh, what we should emphasize less, what new topics you might be interested in or would benefit to you. So your feedback would very much help. With that, and on behalf of myself and Dina, I want to thank you again. The recording uh, will be available sometime later next week sometime so that you'll be able to review it again and we're available to to answer whatever questions you have i know that there was some someone who was having an issue with viewing one of the label files nothing, nothing was appearing so we can try to work through that i'm going to stop recording now and then we'll just be here until people are have, have their questions answered so all the best <laughs>